Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment. We're going to give people just a couple of minutes to sign on. Hello, welcome to the webinar, Age Bias and Cancer Care for Women with Breast Cancer. How can we make it better? I'm Christine Benjamin, the Senior Director of Patient Services and Education at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that has been helping people through breast, ovarian, and uterine cancer for the last 30, 45 years by offering the support of those who've been there. SHARE provides many services, including helplines, support groups, and educational programs. All services are free of charge to participants. For more information, you can visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When Dr. Friedman finishes presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You're welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. The chat section will be disabled. When asking questions, remember that the presenter is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Rachel Friedman is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, the medical director of Dana-Farber's Cancer Care Collaborative, and a clinical researcher in the area of disparities in geriatrics. She has led multiple clinical trials dedicated to populations not well represented in research, and her work has been funded by the National Cancer Institute, Susan G. Komen, and Gateway for Cancer Research. Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for being here. Over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. You can hear me okay? I hope, <laughs> okay. I'm going to share my screen. It's really an honor uh, to be your speaker today. And I want to thank you all for taking time out of your Friday afternoon uh, for this discussion. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you at the end. So this is a talk that is going to focus on age, um, age bias and, and cancer care for older women with breast cancer. How can we make it better? So just because none of you know me, or I don't think any of you know me, I think it's always nice to hear a little bit about who's in front of you. I grew up in a small town called Marblehead in Massachusetts, which is on the North Shore of Boston, in a very lovely historic place that has a beautiful harbor. So if you're ever in the Boston area, please include it on your tour. I went to undergraduate at University of Michigan, um, which has a phenomenal sports program and academic program, and I had great time there. I went from there into medical school at Georgetown in Washington, DC, and had a wonderful four years there. And then I came back home to the Boston area where I trained at the Boston, uh, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center for my residency training, and then joined Dana Farber as a clinical fellow in oncology in 2006. And I have been on faculty there since 2009. Um, I've expanded uh, during this time. Um, I have a lovely husband and three cuties um, here shown, shown <laughs> over this winter um, who have you know, kept things as normal as they can be during this crazy time. So moving on to the talk, um, many of you may be aware that the United States population is aging. And this is an estimation of the percentage of the US population who is going to be 65 and older, which is in the blue, and 85 and older in the orange over time. And as you can see in 2016, about 15% of our population was 65 and older. And in 2060, that is estimated to be 23% of our population. And if you look at ages 85 and older, it will go from 2% up to about 5%, which really accounts for millions of people living in the US of these ages, which is just amazing. And so just to lighten the mood, I have a few trivia questions in here. You can't give me your answer so you can guess uh, in your head <laughs> and then I'll show you uh, the correct answer. But how old is the oldest living woman in the world? Um, 
Well, if any of you didn't know, it is Kane Tanaka, who lives in Japan, and she is 118 um, at her last known age. She is probably older than that now. Um, the oldest living woman in history um, was uh, lived to 122 um, and lived in France. And um, women in general uh, live a lot longer than men. The oldest living man is 111 and lives in Spain. And the oldest ever living man is 116 with only two of the last 24 record breaking aging people in the world being men. So go women. Um, we also know that breast cancer is common in older women. And if you look at these pie charts, it's showing you the percentage of women in the US um, diagnosed by their age. And then on the right is breast cancer deaths by age. And so if you look at patients who are 70 and older, so the gray and the yellow include 70 and older and 80 and older, about 30% of breast cancers diagnosed in the US every year in this age group. But if you actually look at the death, deaths of breast cancer from breast cancer in the US, about 48% of all breast cancer deaths are occurring in older women. And that is because recurrences can happen late into one's diagnosis. Women can live for many years with metastatic breast cancer. And so it is disproportionately affecting older women. We also have millions of US breast cancer survivors. And this is the prevalence, meaning the number of women living with breast cancer. Um, in 2017. And you can see that there are millions of women living in the US either with breast cancer or a history of breast cancer. We also know that US breast cancer mortality is slowly improving. And if you look at um, the timing from the late 90s um, into the 2000 and sort of five, six, seven era, that's where things really started to come down. And you know, it is coming down for all women, fortunately, and these data are always a little bit old because they're registry data from the US, which are always a big lag of a few years at least before they become publicly available. But what I want to point out here is that the pace of this improvement really does vary. And what this graph is showing you is on the left or the y axis is the breast cancer mortality and on the bottom are the is the year and if you look by age, although every age group has a trend downward, meaning that their mortality is going down when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, the pace of that is very variable. And if you look at women 75 and older who are in the red line, you can see that they are improving at the slowest pace. And so there's a gap that widens between these different age groups. And this is a study that we did um, uh, uh, actually, this is, this is, I'm sorry, this is SEER data. So if you look across the age groups, the five-year breast cancer specific survival around the U.S. is 90%. That means that if you are diagnosed with breast cancer in the U.S. today, your likelihood of being alive um, in five years is 90%. And that's quite amazing. And that is true of every age group, except those who are 75 and older, who are close to 90%, but really not quite there consistently. And they're in the yellow there showing you the proportion of them alive at five years related to their breast cancer. We also know that older patients are more likely to present um, with favorable cancers. Um, and so this, this, these trends that I'm telling you about are a little bit puzzling and we're gonna get into sort of why we think that might be happening, but most breast cancers are presenting themselves in a localized way. So they're not distant, they're not metastatic. That is not probably the reason uh, for the worst outcomes or the delay in improvements that we're seeing across this population. And the types of breast cancers older women get are also favorable. Um, so the most common subtype for breast cancer is what we call hormone receptor positive or HR positive and HER2 negative. This means that a cancer is sensitive to hormones, estrogens uh, to be specific, and most breast cancers across age groups are this subtype. And if you look in the green, that's ages 75 and older, they have the highest proportion of this cancer subtype. And if you look at the reasons why older women pass away, um, it's not usually breast cancer, even when they have a breast cancer diagnosis. So if a woman is 
older, these are Medicare data. So these are all patients who are 66 and older that were included. And if you look at their um, stage of diagnosis being three or four, meaning a big tumor or tumor that's in lymph nodes to a large degree or a tumor that has spread outside the breast in the local region, most women who have that kind of diagnosis will have a big risk of passing away from their breast cancer relative to other causes. But if you look at early stage patients, most of them are not dying from breast cancer and cardiovascular disease you know, has been the number one um, reason for death in older patients and only 2% uh, are related to breast cancer in this setting. And yet, despite all these things I showed you, localized disease, favorable subtypes, um, not usually dying from early stage disease, this was a study that we did looking at the rate of breast cancer deaths by age, accounting for the stage of diagnosis. And for every stage, the mortality is higher for older patients than it is for the what we call the reference group in this study, which are 55 to 64 year olds. So if you are 75 and older and you have a breast cancer diagnosis, you are more likely to have a bad outcome from that breast cancer than your younger counterparts. Now, to be clear, you know, this is not um, the, the breast cancer deaths are still not as common as other deaths when stages are early, but you are still more likely to have a bad outcome if you have earlier stage disease, which is very surprising because most women think of breast cancer as being a very indolent problem when you're older. And it is true in many cases, but I think that there's a lot lost here that people aren't aware of. And so why are the outcomes worse? How could this be possible? Um, and, you know, we don't really know. I will tell you some of my theories um, uh, based on what we know and what we don't know, um, but we, we really don't have a great sense of what is going on. And a lot of that is because older patients are not represented in studies. Um, they have more barriers to care. Um, they don't have a lot of what we would call level one evidence to inform their care. They tend to be undertreated, which is sometimes appropriate if that person is very sick from other conditions. But I would argue a lot of inappropriate undertreatment occurs. They're also underserved. They have unique needs. They may have less support. And we know that they are less informed about their disease and they tend to defer a little bit more to caregivers. But older patients also have variable biology and genomics of their tumors, which we don't really understand very well. Uh, they may have more toxicity or side effects from treatment. They have competing priorities and medical conditions. And when you're talking to an 80 year old who has 10 medical problems, it's a very different situation than a 25 year old where this is her only medical issue and you're not really worried about tolerance and all the medications that she's on. Um, and they, you know, older patients really do have unique needs. Um, they're often on a lot of medications and they have functional fragility, meaning that even if they have great function, if you provide therapy that causes a lot of uh, side effects and issues, they are more likely to have a functional decline that is permanent. And so this is where the art comes in um, and, and why it's so hard to make these decisions is that every time we are talking to a patient about her options or his options, we are really trying to balance the cancer risks with the competing risks, meaning what else do we have to worry about? So if we undertreat somebody and don't give them what they need for their breast cancer, they may be more likely to have a cancer recurrence they would be more likely to have symptoms from that recurrence over time and it may impact their survival. But if you overtreat their cancer and give them treatments that they may not have needed or that knocks them out, you have created treatment related toxicity, you've decreased their functional status and there may be other competing causes of death that were more important along the way that, that we should have been thinking about. And the anticipated risk of a recurrence and the timing of that recurrence really needs to be assessed in the context of that individual. And what I mean by that is there are some breast cancers that have a higher risk of recurrence in the first five years. There are other cancers that have a much longer trajectory of risk, even if the risk is lower. And so thinking about the timing of that risk and in the context of what the other person's conditions are can also be helpful when you're making decisions. 
And really, we still don't know how to optimally treat and support our older patients um, when they come to us. We don't know how to care for them, give them what they need to optimize their outcomes and to get them to an active and full life in their aging years. And just to show you a little bit about the clinical trial data and what I was getting at with the lack of accrual of older patients to clinical trials, there's really been stagnant accrual to clinical trials in breast cancer for this age group. This is a study that we did looking at what's called the Alliance. So the Alliance is what's called a cooperative group where there are many centers around the country who get together and run practice changing clinical trials together. And so what I did was I, pulled all the data from all the clinical trials in breast cancer over the years shown here. And we looked at the proportion of older patients uh, enrolled to those studies in all different settings, whether it's preoperative treatment, postoperative treatment, and treatment of metastatic disease. And you can see that the proportion of older patients is um, very low, has not changed much over time. And there are a few exceptions for studies dedicated to older patients. But in general, we really haven't moved the needle for a disease that is mostly represented uh, by this age group. And this is just showing you the individual trials that we included in that analysis in the pre-operative, post-operative, and metastatic setting. So in the blue bars are women ages 65 and older and showing you the proportion of women enrolled to clinical trials in that age group. And in the yellow are those 70 plus. So, you know, only trials that are dedicated to older populations, which is that one reaching 100%, which is called CLGB49907. That was a clinical trial dedicated to patients 65 and older, but pretty much every other study has really failed to meet um, the representation we want uh, for our patients. This is something that has gotten a little bit of press and this is not just specific for breast cancer, um, but the New York Times has done a series of studies about older age and, and cancer. And this is just an article they wrote about the lack of enrollment in clinical trials for older patients. And when we ask providers, why are we not enrolling patients? These are the four most common responses. We asked over a thousand providers, why are you not enrolling older patients? What are the barriers? And these are the four most common things that they stated. Older patients don't meet eligibility because of their other medical issues or their tumor characteristics. The regimens in the clinical trials are too toxic, meaning too many side effects. There's a long distance to the treating center and patients have issues with transportation or spending a lot of time in the medical center. And then patient and family preference is not to enroll. And so I would argue that a lot of this is um, addressable. Um, and I think if done in the right way, um, we can really do better. And so what has happened in the absence of clinical trial information on older patients is what I call the Band-Aid. So if we don't have information on older women, well, how are we gonna know what, what, what to do or what the outcomes are? And so what tends to happen is that there's a lot of pooling of different studies together so that you have enough older patients when you put together three, five, seven clinical trials to say something. Um, but none of those trials typically have information on the patient's background medical issues. Can you hear me? Yes, oh. we can still hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay. It was mute. It looked like I was muted for a second. Um, none of these clinical trials have any granularity on the one's medical issues. They're often what we call underpowered, meaning they don't have enough patients to say something that is statistically relevant. Um, they're often ad hoc analyses, which means that you do your study, you enroll it, and then you say, oh, well, let's go back and look at the 20 women who had you know, who are ages 70 and older, and it's not planned from the start, and there's not enough people to say much about. And often when you pool, when you're pooling information, you're getting variable treatments that are being pushed together, um, variable uh, tumor types, and it's really hard to make sense of it. There have been a number of single center reports, but those are always difficult because it's just a single center and you have no idea if that's generalizable outside. And even the large meta-analyses that are available in breast cancer are underpowered for older patients. And so it is really hard um, to know what we're doing. 
And even when you enroll a patient uh, who is older on a clinical trial, they may not even be the type of person that you'd see in practice. And so what I'm trying to show here is that the clinical trial patient who's older tends to be the one who is really fit and doing planks and willing to drive two hours to you to do a clinical trial, where many of the older patients we see in practice are more like the women on the right who are have other medical conditions, transportation issues, and on average, if you look at the breast cancer clinical trials around the country, on average, it's, the population is eight years younger than the true uh, cancer population. And so, you know, this is something that I think about a lot, and I, I, I think that there's a lot of work to be done. And when we enroll these patients on clinical trials, you know, we also have lost some information because of not collecting the information we really want for um, older patients, their functional status, um, what their socioeconomic background is, what their insurance is, what their access is. We really don't ask these questions routinely on a clinical trial. And so we've written some thought pieces about this. And this is something that I hope is changing because of the what we call the core elements that are collected on clinical trials are probably going to evolve and be better. And this is a part of the um, new initiatives of including this kind of information across the board for all clinical trials, not just ones that are enrolling older patients only, but really across the board to really understand the patient population. And the key is when you're taking care of older patients is understanding the gray of functional age. And there's a big movement now to talk about patients with regard to their functional status rather than their chronological age, because we all know that age in itself doesn't tell you very much. And there's tremendous variety of what people's functional status and health status is across the age span, but especially when you get into the older age groups. And so there's been a lot of discussion of how we can better define this. Um, you know, is it black and white that at 65 you turn old? And I think most of us would argue that that's just not the case anymore, despite our Medicare definitions and things that have stuck. Um, but is it 75? Is it 80? Or is it not an age at all, but more about what we call the geriatric assessment and your functional status, your comorbidities, your cognition, your nutrition, your psychological state, the degree of social support that you have, and all the medications that you take. And the geriatric assessment is a battery of surveys that is used a lot in the geriatric space. So by geriatricians, there's a very long comprehensive geriatric assessment that can be done. And in the world of cancer, there's been a more targeted one that's abbreviated that has been used a lot in studies now to try to get at this issue of what somebody's functional age is, and also what happens to your geriatric assessment and your function over the course of your cancer treatments, like chemotherapy, radiation. I mean, are these things that are impacting one's geriatric assessment? And can we use it to help um, stratify people on who, what treatments they should be getting based on some sort of frailty um, definition. And so I'll talk a little bit more about the geriatric assessment, but in general, it's a survey for patients. Um, it's a battery of surveys that takes about 20 minutes to complete. There are more and more electronic versions of this. These are widely available and publicly available um, for people to look at. And then there's a few very small components that has to happen in the clinic. Um, one is called a timed up and go test, where you watch a patient get up out of their chair, walk 10 feet, walk back and sit down. Um, there's a mini mental cognition scale, and then with something called a performance status, those things can be accomplished by anyone on the treatment team and is a part of the geriatric assessment um, that goes along with all the surveys. And so what's been shown in the literature over and over again is that this geriatric assessment, if done in, in the older patient, can uncover problems not detected by the routine history and physical because it asks about falls and your ability to cook for yourself and whether you drive and who helps you with your groceries and how far can you walk. These are things that people don't generally pay much attention to um, during a routine um, introductory visit. We have seen multiple times over that this geriatric assessment um, at baseline can predict for toxicities with treatments. And so if you have a high score on your geriatric assessment, meaning that you are more functionally impaired, you are more likely to have a bad side effect during the course of your treatment. 
The geriatric assessment also predicts for survival in patients with cancer and a growing list of publications. And it's also been shown to be very feasible on oncology practice. And a pilot has been done that shows, again, it takes about 20 minutes to do this, including patient time and provider time. And so if you can figure out a way to work that in or have patients answer a lot of this before they even come to see you, um, there are ways of really doing this. So just to take a deep breath and pause and speaking about functional status and trying to motivate all of you to be active, um, how old was the oldest woman to run a marathon? <laughs> so it was 92. Um, Harriet Thompson ran the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon. Unfortunately, she died at age 94. She was a two-time breast cancer survivor. And I think this is just amazing uh, that she was able to do this. Um, and there's a lot of press about her if you Google her, <laughs> which is where I found this. So I talked a little bit about the barriers that providers describe in their clinical practice. And in the same survey, asking people what the problems were, we asked them, what are your opinions about the solutions? We gave them a list of potential strategies to improve upon the evidence we have in older patients. And then we also had write-ins and ways that we could collect ideas. And the top three things that providers said was create more dedicated studies for older patients, minimize the exclusion criteria, meaning that don't make it hard for a patient to go on because of some medical issues, unless it's relevant, and require that all clinical trials have some kind of expansion or dedicated endpoints when it's relevant. If the disease is common in older people, then your trial should account for this and either enroll it that way or expand it if you haven't done well once your clinical trial finishes accruing. And I think these are all very possible and there has been a lot of movement towards all of these issues actually. Um, and so I am hopeful that we're in the right, right direction. And just to give you some examples of what I mean, um, what's been done in the past and what we're trying to do now. So in the area of thinking about creating dedicated trials for patients, um, the sort of hallmark study is a study I mentioned earlier when we were talking about accrual by age. Um, this is the CLGB49907 trial. This was led by Dr. Hyman Muss, who is at University of North Carolina, formerly at University of Vermont. He is an amazing human, um, and he did a study which was looking at standard chemotherapy versus an oral chemotherapy option for patients 65 and older who needed chemotherapy for their breast cancers. And unfortunately, the oral chemotherapy that we had hoped would be a good alternative to the standard did not hold up as a good uh, option. And so this trial really um, didn't allow for any kind of replacement of a lesser toxic therapy um, and was a really important study that got done on a national scale. The other amazing thing about this trial is that it's the gift that keeps on giving because there was a sub-study on quality of life and they asked about cognition and they asked about lymphedema. And there have been many subsequent publications from this trial, which was mainly focused on the outcomes from breast cancer, but we've been able to sort of enrich the experience for women receiving standard therapy and this alternative therapy in all these ways because of the data that we collected on study, which is really an amazing um, accomplishment. There's also been studies in the radiation space looking at um, whether or not to include radiation uh, for treatment of early stage breast cancer. And this trial was really important, also done through our cooperative group system and led by Kevin Hughes at Mass General Hospital in Boston. But this really showed an overlay um, of outcomes for patients who do and don't get radiation with stage one breast cancer, as long as they're taking tamoxifen. Um, and so this has really changed practice and is now an option uh, for women who fit the criteria um, and is discussed regularly. There are other studies going on. I don't wanna get too into the weeds, but I just wanna show you that this is an area of active um, research. And I do really um, have hope that things are changing for our older patients and they're gonna have more data to inform their care. This is a really cool study going on in Europe right now, which is randomizing patients who would otherwise be recommended for chemotherapy to get an enhanced anti-hormone therapy approach. Um, instead of chemotherapy. So it's called a randomized study and it's lots of focus on functional status, quality of life and breast cancer outcomes. 
We just enrolled at Dana-Farber um, in addition to 10 other sites, um, a study looking at an alternative program for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. HER2 positive breast cancer only happens in about 10% of older patients. And because of that, we lowered the age for this trial so that we would have it um, more, you know, more open um, to 60 and older. But every patient on this study um, with HER2 positive disease got something called TDM1 which is an approved targeted therapy that doesn't come with hair loss and some of the usual traditional side effects of cancer therapies. And we gave this TDM1 treatment to all patients and we have followed them. This trial has fully enrolled and we're now waiting to be able to report on the results um, at five years. We included a lot of rich information here. We asked patients about their symptoms every month on iPads. We collected tissue on them so that we can do genomic analyses. We collected biomarkers of aging uh, from their blood work that they were already getting for their treatments. Um, and we really tried to make this sort of the whole package of understanding the patient experience in addition to the breast cancer outcomes. Um, we call it the ATOP study. Um, so it is focused on a disease outcome as our primary objective, but there's a lot in here um, that I hope is gonna provide really useful information for our older patients with HER2 positive disease and perhaps bring out an alternative to the standard therapies. Um, another hot area that I'm very interested in is how we stop screening for cancer in older adults, finding the right words, finding the right time, having the discussion, and doing it in a really thoughtful way. This is another thing that's been picked up by the media a lot, and the New York Times has done two big articles on this issue, um, and there's been a lot of thought pieces on this in the medical literature as well. And this is something that I think about a lot in the survivorship space for older patients because it's really hard to stop your mammograms if you're still getting them, um, and we don't really know how to do that. It's very hard. We're all attached to our mammograms. It does take a long time for mammograms to have an impact on one's survival. And having some guidelines for this, um, I think is really important and something that I've been working on um, to help patients and their providers come up with a good plan um, when it's time to stop. And we developed a patient guide around this, which we're now testing at Dana-Farber, asking patients, you know, is our mammogram still right for me? And when is the right time to stop? And what are my disease risks? And what are the pros and cons of mammograms? Because it's not all pros. It's there are serious cons to mammography at all ages, but especially in older age. And so trying to find the right balance of that, I think, is an important topic uh, for patients. I also just want to comment on the power of what we would call cohort studies. And so I mentioned the geriatric assessment to you before, but this is a really amazing study led by Arthi Huria at City of Hope, which enrolled 500 patients with cancer, not just breast cancer, but all cancers. And everybody did a baseline geriatric assessment, that battery we talked about. And then toxicities of therapy were calculated at every time that they were in the office seeing their provider for their next treatment. And then they were followed. And what was really amazing is that the score that comes together from various clinical variables, information from the geriatric assessment was incredibly predictive of having a bad side effect with your treatment over the course of your chemotherapy. And this has now gotten, um, a lot of attention and they just tried to tweak this model for breast cancer. Um, I was able to participate in the study at Dana-Farber. We enrolled a lot of patients who were starting chemotherapy and did the same kind of thing. And this model of understanding the risk for side effects was tweaked for patients receiving therapy for breast cancer because it is hard to combine all cancers together uh, just because the regimens and considerations are really so different. And in the breast cancer model, the things that came through as important for predicting toxicity were the types of chemotherapy um, that you're getting. Um, and, oh, sorry. And um, they, you know, and the duration of therapy um, was very important and whether certain regimens were included was also very important. And they looked at other things in this study too, at what that score will tell you. If you had a high score, you would have more likelihood of having a bad side effect. You were more likely to be hospitalized. 
you are more likely to have a dose reduction. You are more likely to have a dose delay, meaning that some part of your chemotherapy didn't happen on time. You are more likely to discontinue your treatment. And in total, relative dose intensity, which is at the bottom, is sort of the sum amount of dosing you got um, that was initially uh, conceived for your treatment plan. And the higher the scores, you know, it's very consistent across all of these metrics that these um, functional assessments can be really important. The part that we don't know yet is what do you do about it? So, you know, the next, the next step of this work, which is now starting to happen and is underway in research is, okay, if a person has this high score and you know they're likely to have these problems, what do you do? Are you supposed to dose reduce? Should you rethink whether chemotherapy should even be used? Should you start low and then ease in if they do okay? And are there some side effects that are more important than others? You know, some patients get a very severe anemia that would be sort of included in this as a severe side effect, but it lasted one treatment, that person rebounded their blood count. And that to me is not the same as causing a debilitating neuropathy or numbness and tingling of your hands and feet that doesn't fully go away. And I think sorting out which of these side effects matter the most to patients in the long term is also uh, very important. But I think this is the beginning of um, sort of setting the stage for these follow up studies. I've been conducting a cohort um, at Dana Farber and some of our partner institutions that we call Elevate. And the idea is how can we understand why women are doing a little bit worse with their breast cancers? How can we empower them to be a part of this research? And so this is a project that asks any woman 70 and older with a new diagnosis to be included. And all we do is follow them over time. There are surveys that are done online or on paper or on phone um, every six to 12 months for five years, which ask a lot about their treatment decisions, the knowledge about their cancers, barriers, adherence, all sorts of things. Each survey is a little bit different, but then there's some overlap. Um, we are drawing blood at three time points. We're doing medical record reviews to see what treatments people are getting, and we're collecting old tissue samples. So not new tissue samples, but samples from someone's surgery or biopsy that we can use to understand the sort of underpinnings of cancer, because there's really no data set that's collected tissue like this. Um, we've enrolled at this point, it's I think 92 patients and our goal is 200. And then we'll start to um, look at what we've got. Um, but I'm really looking forward to um, continuing this project and uh, getting to our accrual. And so I've been working to start a program at Dana-Farber that, I would, um, that I'm calling Turning Silver into Gold, which is really bringing all the different elements we talked about into a program that you know, engages patients in research, tells them how much we need to hear from them to understand how to take care of them. That also brings in the resources they need for clinical care and pays attention to the unique needs of the older patient. And then providing specific support materials, transportation help, educational materials, and really good communication with the other providers caring for that patient as part of the program. And so um, this is about to launch at Dana-Farber. We have the beginnings of it through our research program, but I'm really excited um, that you know, in the next few months, this will actually be a reality. And then in the last few minutes, because I do want to leave time for questions, you know, there's been a lot of movement too as part of our way to improve upon um, our enrollment to clinical trials is not just to dedicate trials to older patients, which I showed you for clinical trials, for cohort studies, for survey projects, but also expand the eligibility requirements. This was a very cool study that Kaiser did where they looked through their huge medical record database and Kaiser, as many of you know, is a huge uh, care provider, uh, mostly in California. And they looked at patients with breast, colorectal, lung cancer, and bladder cancer. And they said, okay, if you exclude patients who've ever had a cancer before, a different cancer from your clinical trial, how many percentage, you know, what percentage of patients would be excluded in your study? If they have a history of heart disease, how many patients would be excluded in your study? If they have a history of mild kidney dysfunction or age itself, these are the percentages of people who would be excluded from your study. And I think the key message from this is that we really need to be open, as open as possible, because if your drug has nothing to do with kidney function 
and is excreted and metabolized through one's liver and kidney function is not a consideration, well then don't have kidney function as an exclusion criteria. You wanna keep it open. If a drug is affecting the kidney, if the drug is affecting the heart, well then it's certainly appropriate to make sure things are safe. But I think we've gotten used to in oncology, these boilerplates of you know, using standardized values without even thinking about it. And then you end up with this population that doesn't represent the sort of usual medical conditions that people out there are experiencing. And there is a huge push around the country right now to change that. And then finally, the third sort of way that we can do better is should we be requiring trials to expand if if they're not representative and should we be dedicating endpoints? And just as an example, um, this was one of the practice changing studies in breast cancer where we found out that trastuzumab or Herceptin was a very important part of treatment for patients with breast cancer, but only 16% of patients in this practice changing trial were 60 plus, and they didn't even report ages beyond that. They just said 60 and older. So, you know, how many patients in their 80s were in this study? Do we really know what it does for those patients and what the side effects are? And there's really limited information provided. And so, you know, I'm a big proponent of thinking how we can expand studies if we know that we haven't done well in certain populations. And this isn't just true of older patients, this is true of all underrepresented patients, racial ethnic minority patients, um, patients who have specific comorbidities, we're just not good at, at, at getting this done. There have also been some studies which have been really creative with their endpoints. And I really like these few studies I'm about to show you. This one was uh, an endpoint, instead of just your breast cancer outcome or your survival, these investigators, this was a lung cancer trial, looked at what's called therapeutic success. And that means that all of these things have to be present for you to have succeeded uh, for that patient in your trial. And it says, did they get at least three cycles? at the planned dose and schedule? Did they respond, meaning did they actually have benefit from it? And did they not have a horrible toxicity event? And if you met all those criteria, you were considered therapeutically successful and you would be counted in that endpoint. And I think that this kind of model is really great because it's incorporating so many things, right? It's not just about how long you live, it's about how well you're living and what you're being, you know, you know, what you're experiencing with regard to side effects. This is another similar one that's called treatment utility, which has now been used in a couple different studies. This was a gastric cancer study, not breast, where they defined overall treatment utility at nine weeks as the primary endpoint. And again, this included, are you benefiting from treatment? Are you satisfied with the way that you're doing and how you're feeling? Did you not have any major toxicity event? And did you not drop your quality of life a lot? And if all those things were true, that was a good treatment utility. That was a very worthwhile treatment for you. But if those things weren't happening, you know, what are we doing? And we need to be reassessing this uh, for these patients. And so moving forward, just to kind of summarize a little bit, we've really seen some challenges some successes, and hopefully some paths forward to affect change in clinical trial enrollment for older adults and other underrepresented populations. But this is going to take a coordinated national and even international effort to get this done, because it really can't be done by one center in one place around the country. We really need optimized and tailored outcomes, which are only going to be, be coming to us if we can prospectively study and understand and inform the care for all patients. And I think the bar needs to be higher uh, for what we're doing. And I think the whole key is that we wanna get it right. We wanna form evidence-based treatments that fit into the whole person, his or her preferences, his or her other medical conditions, his or her toxicity risk, and really put it together in the most meaningful way for the patient so that she can thrive. And there are many resources out there if you're interested in this or you wanna learn more. Um, ePrognosis is a free website where you can look at um, life expectancy based on a person's medical conditions. The CARG um, models for predicting toxicity are completely publicly available on the CARG website, which is Cancer and Aging Research Group, as, long, as well as the geriatric assessment we talked about, www.mycarg.org. 
There's a lot of patient resources. I personally love the cancer.net resource, which is from ASCO. And um, I actually am one of the editors of some of the parts of this with the older patients. And it's really good content that's vetted by um, clinicians. And then there's a lot of different policy statements and ways that we can support um, these patients that are available. And you know, we're hoping to build up our resources at, uh, in our program as well. And so to close, I thought that it might be worth using some quotes of the keys to longevity from the people who know. And so the woman who was the oldest living woman in the world, who's now passed away, who lived to 122, said that the secret to old age was olive oil, port, and chocolate. And she gave up smoking at a very late age, which is quite amazing. Um, a person who lived to 116 said, eat light to live long studying math and playing the game Othello, and do not get angry and keep a smile on your face, which I thought was a very lovely way uh, to finish this talk. But these are the secrets to the success of living, which I think we should all take to heart. Um, everything I presented on the work that we're doing um, and the work of others, of my mentors, um, is a huge team effort. Um, I have an amazing project team at Dana-Farber who helps me with all the clinical trials and patient engagement that we do. And um, I just want to thank my mentors and then the funders who believe in this work, realize the importance of it and are willing to fund it. Um, and with that, I will stop. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. We have a couple of questions that came in over the Q&A and some questions that were provided beforehand as well. So I'll just go ahead and start and the audience can continue to put some questions into the Q&A and hopefully we'll have time enough to answer most of the questions. So the first question is, what can older patients do to ensure that they are receiving the same information or treatment options as younger women? Well, I think you can outright ask that question. You know, when you're a patient, you should feel empowered to make sure that you're getting all of your options. And, um, you know, I, I, I caution people to say, you know, to the provider, just give me the options because whenever patients get options, it's overwhelming. They need suggestions and recommendations, but I think that you should feel empowered to ask what the true treatment options are and how might they tailor them for you if there is some concern you have in particular or something like that. But, um, you know, there are ways, there are resources and places you can find the sort of general things that we do with breast cancer, but I would tell you to just ask your providers. Um, or get a second opinion if you feel like you're not getting the right information. So in a related question, people are asking about like different tests that are offered to different patients. And then people are asking about the reliability of some of these tests. One, as an example, is the decision RT test. So two part so, question. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of, um, Okay, so there's all different tests, so it's hard to know exactly where to go with this, but the decision RT, so there's a lot of genomic tests that are done, you know, there's two types of genomics. One is your hereditary genetics, which answer questions like, why did I get this cancer? They are usually done in, in family histories with lots of cancer, but nowadays are very open and able to be um, done in most patients. And there's also the tumor genetics which are used more for infor informing decisions. And the two main types of genetic testing you can do are ones to help you with chemotherapy decision-making. And then the new frontier is helping with radiation uh, decision-making. So if somebody has a low-risk tumor and they wanna know if they really need radiation after the lumpectomy, which is a standard package of treatments, this decision RT test is a genomic profile that provides information on how much radiation is anticipated to benefit somebody. And we're using it a little bit in our center. I think that we kind of get a sense of what the clinical features are in patients that can be safely omitting radiation, but it is certainly you know, the next frontier. We use the genomics for chemotherapy decision-making all the time. Oncotype DX is the most common one we use in the US, but there's other ones, PAM50, Mamaprint. These are all ways of trying to understand benefits of treatment so that you can tailor your recommendations. So a couple of questions are coming in about geriatric assessments. 
So people are wondering, um, in your opinion, how many patients are receiving geriatric ass assessments and should all patients get some kind of a functional assessment? Great questions. Um, so geriatric assessment is not done very much in clinical practice. There are a few small centers around the country that have a geriatric oncology program. And as part of that program, they will typically do this routinely in a lot of their patients as they walk in the door. University of Rochester, City of Hope, Ohio State um, have programs for geriatrics. And big, big centers, it's harder because it's usually divided up by disease area and not so much all of geriatrics and any cancer that a geriatric patient has. Um, and so it is a problem to get the geriatric assessment in, involved in clinic outside of research. So for our research studies, everybody gets it. We have dedicated staff to do the testing with patients, but in a clinical setting, it is hard because you need to carve out time. You need to carve out private space. Um, you need to um, add that time to the person's day there or the clinician's visit there. There's been a lot of pushback on including this routinely, but there have also been equally uh, uh, equal pushback on why aren't we doing this in everybody. And there's actually a very cool study that talks about the cost of different tests that one gets in cancer. And it's like a blood count is $300 and a CAT scan is $6,000. And using 15 minutes to do the geriatric assessment is like $50, but everybody, and it's probably more useful than a lot of the other tests we get, but it's just not done. So lots of discussion about this around the country. There's also discussion on whether you use something modified or abbreviated, because um, there are other scales that can be used, not just the one I spoke about. Um, there's a, a number of other scales of frailty and the same kind of information from functional status. So it's a work in progress. Um, my vision is that anyone who identifies as, you know, um, somebody who is vulnerable to functional decline should be offered these tests. But it's hard to know without doing it across the board because you can't always tell. Sometimes you uncover something, you know, somebody looks really good, they're sitting in the chair and then you ask them to get up to the exam table and they just absolutely can't do it, you know, and you just have no idea unless you ask them to move. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. uh, sitting there, they look like they're, you know, perfectly healthy. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's a lot that we can uncover with it. And I hope that it finds its way into clinical care more and more. Thank you for that. So there are several questions about treatment toxicity and side effects. And people are wondering if it's worth, you know, putting themselves through what they consider harsh treatment. Is it, is it worth it? It's, it's so individual. I think the key thing, and you should push providers on this, is trying to balance what the benefits are. Because if the benefits of a treatment are huge, I generally do it <laughs> unless there are real concerns about how somebody's going to tolerate it and what's going to happen. If the benefits are small, which is sometimes the case, then you really have to think about it you know, because, you know, what, what is the balance and what's important to that patient? What are they worried about? Um, how important is breast cancer in their life? Meaning that if I have a 95 year old woman who has congestive heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure, and a small breast cancer, you know, I'm doing the minimal breast cancer therapy because those other conditions are so much more life-threatening but if a woman has no medical issues and she's 80 and has a big tumor and needs treatment, well, then she should absolutely get it. You know, so I think it's, it's really trying to find the right balance for the patient and it's our job to guide. And that's sort of what I said also with the time to recurrence. So there are certain breast cancer subtypes that have a high risk of recurrence in the first five years. So if you're worried about that person, even if they have some medical issues, you may be a little more aggressive than the patient whose cancer may have a 20 year, very low risk trajectory, and they're already in their nineties, you know? So I think you really just have to put it all into perspective and um, try to make the best decision you can. I, you know, I always say to patients, I wish I had the crystal ball. I wish I could tell you exactly how you're gonna feel on this chemo. I can tell you the way it goes for many. I wish I could tell you whether your cancer would come back if we did it or didn't do it but we don't have it, you know, we don't have the, that information. We have to do the best we can with the information we have and what you want and what I think you need and what your family likes and, you know, put it all together as best you can. 
it's not easy. <laughs> right. So there's a great question here about clinical trials. Any advice for those of us who are not in large medical center areas? Is trial participation becoming more available virtually? That is such a great question. Um, yes. So I just submitted a grant for this actual exact thing. There are what's called decentralization um, grants now that are coming out, which are trying to maintain research engagement despite limitations in travel, um, trying to harness the virtual visits and local labs and local imaging when you can, but not miss out on opportunities in big centers. So I would say stay tuned. I think people are treading lightly here just because nobody knows if the virtual stuff is going to stay. Um, I think most of us think it will. And I think everybody's seeing the benefits of it. And so there's going to be a huge lobby to keep it around because it really does help. Um, so I think stay tuned on that one. Um, the, the project I submitted is something where you're trying to combine a few virtual visits and then an in-person so that you just limit because it's for medical and older patients. So it's trying to make sure you connect with those patients, but not make them come in as much mm -hmm. if they're doing all right. Right. Um, so, you know, I think there are ways of balancing that. So there's another question about clinical trials. I love this question so much. So when do you get into clinical trials? I thought it was when your treatment stopped working. That is a great question. And that is a very common, um, I, I hate to use the word misconception because it's such an informed question. Um, but clinical trials are opportunities. They are used in every part of one's care. I, you know, being a part of a huge clinical trial enterprise at Dana-Farber, I use clinical trials in the prevention setting, in the post-operative setting, in the survivorship setting, using exercise, getting access to new agents. You know, um, we, we are moving the field constantly and being a part of a clinical trial is a wonderful experience for patients for the most part. Um, they're watched extra closely. They're getting access to something that they wouldn't normally get access to. And I use clinical trials in a very early stage setting, <clears throat> if they're appropriate, um, in the early metastatic setting, if they're appropriate. They are meant to be used as options along the way. And clinical trials are not placebo. You know, if there's an active therapy, it's never that you're not giving somebody that at least that. So most clinical trials are giving you something that's established as the standard or something that's established with the standard plus something that may help it even work better. So it's never taking away active therapy and it's often um, really building on standard practices and standard care. And I mean, every agent that gets approved for breast cancer, that's the new hot agent was tested in clinical trials for a decade. Um, and we knew it was working because it's in clinic with us and we see it working and I have access to it. And so I use it early on. So it's really, um, it's not about, I have no other option. It's about how can I use this along the way? Um, and whenever I go over options with patients, I say, these are the standard options. These are the, you know, hormonal options if it's that, if it's appropriate for that type of cancer. And here are clinical trial options. And let's pick from the menu and we can go back and forth. We can go up here, we can go down here, we can go in here, and it's all a part of your option along the way. We hear many patients talk about the fact that sometimes um, previous treatment will exclude them from a, a clinical trial, right? So it's important sometimes to really consider what the, you know, the, the um, what the eligibility, uh, eligibility yeah. and no, it's, it's true. I mean, if a certain medication is going through a process where they are looking for a specific indication, they may not want you to have had this or that, or be in the first treatment setting or second treatment setting. And, you know, again, being as open as possible with your enrollment, I think is key, but when trials are small and getting going, they often are very niche. And yes, you have to kind of read between the lines and the teams will tell you if you're eligible or not, this isn't something you have to know, but there can be funny exclusions. And there are other ways for patients to participate in research, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a shameless plug in here for NBC Connect for patients living with metastatic disease. So it's a patient registry where patients put in their own information. There are many patient registries across many disease areas where you could put in the information that you have about your treatment and also quality of life and that can help research move forward as well. Uh, so 
one quick last question. So we talked about some metastatic disease. Regarding older women and DCIS, what are your thoughts about active, active surveillance regardless of grade? So DCIS means pre-cancer and there's a big variety of how this is approached from surgery to surgery with radiation, to pills, to nothing, to surveillance. It's a very hot topic. We are trying very hard uh, to find the patients who don't need much. Um, and can still do very well, but it is hard. It's a hard area to study. And there's a do more mentality, um, especially in the US for DCIS. So we tend to overtreat them. So I do think this is coming. Um, we're not there yet. Most patients do have their DCIS treated, but there's a large study called Comet, which is looking at observation in certain populations and not you know, treating all of this. So stay tuned. And this is a really important last question. So I'm just, I'm putting it in under the wire. How do I find out about clinical trials? She's interested in contributing if appropriate, but she doesn't know how. So um, you can ask your providers. Um, there's also clinicaltrials.gov, which is the huge warehouse in the US um, for clinical trials. So if you search your subtype or search whatever, it will come up with a sea of information um, on clinical trials around the US and even sometimes the world. Um, that's the biggest repository. It's not that user-friendly, <laughs> um, but, um, and, and I think using your advocacy groups and talking to your peers um, and asking your providers if there's anything that you can do and reminding them that you're interested if something comes up because sometimes they forget and they don't talk about something that actually is relevant for you, but they think it's not the right thing or they just forgot about it, so. And on the SHARE website, there are a couple of search engines that could help people connect people to clinical trials. And for breast cancer, we also recommend uh, breastcancertrials.org for early stage and metastatic trial search for uh, metastatic disease. And these are trials that were taken from clinicaltrials.gov, but put into language that we can actually understand. So you could check that out too. So Dr. Friedman, thank you so much. This has been an incredible presentation. We're so grateful to you for your time and your expertise. Thank you everyone for participating. We appreciate the questions and your attention today. And if you wouldn't mind just uh, filling out a survey at the end of this webinar, that gives us information that we could use to create programs going forward. Dr. Friedman, thanks again. Thank you you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a nice day and weekend. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>